Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. Good to hear everybody. Hope everybody's had a good week. And uh, the camera is up and running, so those who are online, thank you for joining us this morning, and we look forward to worshiping together. Let's start off by singing number 531. 531. Get our voices nice and warmed up by singing 531, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of line. Hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. Worlds his mighty voice obey, laws which never shall be broken, for their guidance he hath made. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, for he is glorious. Never shall his promise fail. God hath made the saints victorious. Sin and death shall not prevail. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. Praise the God of our salvation. Host on high his power proclaim, heaven and earth and all creation. Lord and magnify his name. Hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen, amen. And number 887. Praise the name of Jesus, 887. We'll sing this through once and then have a prayer before class. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we do come before you today to praise your name, to praise the name of your Son, to thank you for the many gifts and blessings you've given us, to thank you that you've given us uh, a church, this congregation, and, and so many other blessings and spiritual blessings that we have. We just so appreciate everything you've done for us, and for that we want to praise your name, and we praise your name because you are worthy, because you deserve it, because you are God. We do pray that you be with those for our hearts and minds who are sick and hurting right now. Watch over them. We pray that you will allow healing to take place and allow people to get the help they need. We just pray for those we know who are facing upcoming surgeries, procedures, and testing. We pray that it will all go smoothly and well. And we pray that for those from our congregation and those from our community and just others that we know of throughout the world that, that again, healing will be available so that they can return to normal, normal walks of life. And we pray that you continue to meet our other needs. We pray that you will answer our prayers according to your will and not our own, and that you'll continue to bless us beyond what we deserve, beyond what we can even fathom. And it's in Jesus' name we say this prayer. 
Amen. So we know we have some traveling, couple families traveling still, and also some still dealing with sickness, and we want to, again, keep all those in our minds and uh, prayers this week. Um, but we want to remind everybody that tonight is our singing night, and as always, there's a sheet uh, out back. If anybody wants to put a song request down, we'll sh make sure Mark or Todd leaves that for you. Um, that's uh, again, the jokes don't get better, but uh, we will uh, do our best to lead any songs uh, possible that are requested. And uh, afterwards tonight, uh, there will be a time of fellowship uh, with foods that can be eaten with fingers or not. So uh, please plan on coming and being involved in that. We've been discussing the church. Um, by the way, next week I will be out of town, so you'll get a break from the discussion class. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but, but before we take that break... Um, well, let me give you your homework assignment. Be, you, know, you know, as a good teacher, sometimes at the end of class we get rushed and we forget to give you your homework assignment. Uh, and I don't want to do that. I, I want to give you your homework assignment at the beginning so we make sure and do that. And here's the homework assignment. You have two weeks to complete two questions. It's not even essay questions. One answer each. Short answers will do. The homework is... What makes you come to worship? What will make others come to worship? And in reality, I, I, as, as much as we joke and, and you know, homework, but I, I really want you to answer those questions, and I would like you to write it down uh, uh, again. Email, uh, uh, text message. Uh, uh, I don't think smoke signals will work for this one, but uh, um, you know, I any written form, electronically or on a piece of paper. If you'll write that down, what makes you come to worship? What will make someone else come to worship? And and honestly, I, you know, maybe there's a list of things. I don't want that. I want one thing, one thing from each of us. What makes you come to worship? What will make somebody else come to worship? That's that's your homework. Two weeks to complete it. Uh, please turn it in before class um, because it's going to be part of our next class uh, if things go as planned today. So it probably won't be, but we'll try. All right. So all that being said, uh, we've been discussing the church. We've been defining what is the church, and we've been looking in the last few weeks over what is the mission of the church. And we've really done well on both defining the mission, giving the, the rote answer, the well, we evangelize, we edify, we, we uh, encourage, you know. Uh, 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 wait, ed evangelize, edify, uh, benevol. We been, do benevolence. There we go. There's, a, <laughs> there's the third one. I knew they weren't all supposed to alliterate. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, we, we, we did good at, at that definition answer, but also going beyond that uh, and, and getting down to also just the mission of, of glorifying Christ and God in all that we do. Why do we evangelize? To glorify Christ and God. Why do we build each other up? To glorify Christ and God. Why do we meet and worship on a regular basis? To glorify Christ and God. We do all of our mission, whatever part of it we do, to, to do the Lord's will and glorify him before man and the community. Um, so, so we've been doing a good job. And now the problem is we know the road answers. We have really good discussion about the rote answers and go, you know, next level on those answers. But what are we going to do about it? Because at the end of the day, no matter how well we can define that, no matter how well we can answer the, the test question, what are we going to do about that? Are we doing that? This takes some honesty. You know, are we doing that? Um, let's start with this question because I can't remember what I said last week we would discuss this week as our next question. Uh, so let's start with this question. Um, I, what can we do about that? <laughs> does that make sense? 
I, like we can come up with all sorts of big grand things. Uh, we, we, I hope we can come up with scriptures too. But what can we do about fulfilling the mission of the church? Okay. That's what I'm struggling with. Right. To how to implement anything. How, how to implement the things that I teach. Right. And there definitely is a struggle to do it because if there wasn't a struggle to do it, we'd all be doing it. Um, I do throw out that reminder that we reviewed last week. Uh, uh, is, it, is, it, is it the church's mission to convert people? Do you remember th those who were here last week discussing this? We did, yeah. Is it the church's mission to convert people? No, it's not. What does Paul say? First Corinthians three six. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Whose job is it to convert? God's. So we got to be careful and not try to stand in His place. Uh, put too much emphasis on ourselves. Uh, uh, and, and forget that it's going to be God converting them to God's ways. Now, with that being said, so that means, oh, God converts them, I do nothing, right? There's a very, very prominent uh, uh, religious theology that actually their implications are exactly that. Oh, God chooses. God pre-selects who he wants so we can't do anything about it. If you pull that out to fruition, I always want to ask those groups, why do they evangelize? You know. So just because God does the converting, what's our part of the mission? What's our part of the, the plan? I, I hear whispering, but I didn't clean them out this morning. Teach. Te to, to still do our part. Whether, whether we're throwing our, our, our seed on the rocky ground or not, you know, we still fulfill our mission to glorify God by teaching, edifying, and benevolence. And that's the thing. What happens? What happens when you hit your head against a wall constantly? You get a headache. <laughs> All right. Maybe depending on the structure of the wall, you might put a hole in the wall. What good does that do? Does it sometimes feel like that's what we're doing with the mission of the church? Let's let's ask let's ask this question. In a perfect world. You know, how, what, would, what would us fulfilling the mission of, I, and I think we're all thinking evangelism, so let's go that way. What would, what would be the perfect scenario of evangelism? Everybody in the church. Right. We say, hey, you come, come to church with me. They show up, and, and they hear a lesson or two, and they go, that's great, and they come forward, and they're baptized, and they, they're here now. How often does that happen? <laughs> all right. I heard a zero. It used to happen. 50, 60, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. There were time periods where, where maybe that did seemingly happen. Now, there, there's two caveats to that, but I saw a hand. Yes. Okay. People were more, more predisposed, so I think our bases were also more than that sort of stuff. Exactly. Did the world look different 50 years ago? Okay, let's not pick on the world. Did this country, did this region look different 50 years ago? Yeah. Okay, uh, think about it this way. Go back 150 years. What's the first thing you've removed? Technology. Man, it's like he shares half of my brain. All right. Technology is exactly what I was thinking. No electricity, uh, 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 no, uh, uh, you know, no TV, no, no radio. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure about that one. Was there a radio yet in the 18? Plumbing. plumbing. No plumbing. All right. Can, religious be, can religion be entertaining? Okay, I got one yes. So it can be. Certainly. Certainly. Um, why does a certain very polished, big-smiled man, you know, have 
thousands of people in person and watching online and he's selling books and and uh, doing tours and on television is he entertaining oh i heard no i think he is <laughs> all right you know because because the truth is the first time i heard that that man no it's not me uh, <laughs> the first time i heard that man i was entertained I was challenged. I like this guy. Like I looked into his theology, thinking it might be a little closer to mine than I thought. Then I looked a little deeper, and it wasn't. But you know, like like it was entertaining. So religion can be entertaining. Go ahead. So depending upon because you, you throw it out multiple time periods, depending upon which time period you're talking about, there were different stressors. There were different things happening. Right. Mm-hmm. based on the things that we're experiencing in the society around us. Right, and that's, that's tying in Wednesday night's class. Why at the turn of the century are so many songs, at the turn of the 20th century, 1800s and 1900s, there's so many songs written about heaven. At the turn of the, the 20th to the 21st century, there's so many songs written about the identity of God because society changed, and we needed a different emphasis. Very good. In the, in the middle of last century, in the 1940s and, and even into the 50s, there's a lot of songs about Christian warfare. I, I have sermon books that date back to the 1800s from various sources. And it's funny. Um, when's the last time you heard a good sermon condemning communism from the pulpit? It's been about, I don't know, 30 years? Now, now that being said, how many times did you hear it in the 80s and 70s? In the 60s. If you didn't hear it here, let me tell you, it was being preached from Church of Christ pulpits across the nation because I have the copies of them. So, what changed? All right. the, the, the big bad boogeyman of communism fell, and so we stopped talking about it. And, and, and that's, that's the thing, is, is you know, uh, we, we talk about the difference. So, all that being said, so go back to 1870. All right, you live here or Eastern Kentucky or somewhere more rural, rural, hate that word, (laughs) Uh, somewhere more rural and um, no electricity, no, uh, what is your form of entertainment? All right, reading, social gatherings, gatherings. how many times, kicking the can, how many (laughs) times? Better than the bucket. How many times uh, uh, did, did, you know, did these small little towns, how many times did they actually have a preacher? You go back to rural, this area, 150 years, they had a preacher maybe once or twice a year. That's a big deal. Okay. I love that someone already implied that I'm not entertaining. Um, But... (laughs) All joking aside, <clears throat> can our worship be entertaining? I know, I know. We're wandering into scary waters here. Can it? Let me ask you this question. If not, why do you walk out that door and say, good job, preacher? I'm not doing it for the entertainment value, and I don't want to even suggest you're here for the entertainment value because there's a lot better entertainment out there. But one of the things we get out of coming together is, uh, you know, it, why does it matter who does the preaching? Okay, yeah, I know, commands, and we got to make sure the right person is doing God makes sure they're scriptural. But, but if I can do it in a way that, that gets your attention— and helps you remember something or, or notice something new that you haven't heard before, if I can do it in that way— it's more likely going to stick with you a little better and you might be a little entertained by that. Is that wrong in of itself? Now, if the only reason we're getting together is for entertainment purposes, <laughs> no, that's not, we are getting together to glorify God. But at the same time, we get something out of it. Uh, as, as uh, remember Seth used that illustration of we're shooting for this, 
And so coming back down on the trajectory is where we find things we get out of it as we're coming back down. We're shooting to glorify God, but as we come back down, we get you know, our, our encouragement, uh, our fellowship, our learning, and a little bit of entertainment, maybe? See, the reason why 150 years ago we had three-week meetings where, where we have to put a tent outside to hold everybody was because it was entertaining, even for the restoration preachers who came by, through, and then also the denominational preachers, and, and, and all of, it was it was their form of entertainment. So when you said, "Hey, the preachers come to town, and we all got to gather," everybody's like, "Oh yeah!" Now you say, "Hey, the pre uh, preachers come to town, we all got to gather," and they go, eh, "But but but the Super Bowl's on, but." You know, I got to see who 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 did the who done it this week on on Law and CSI uh, uh, Orlando. You know, I I, I got to watch that. It's because we had different forms of entertainment, so people don't come to this form that used to be entertaining. And and there again, we're thinking of the outsider. We know our purpose is not to come together to find entertainment, but when we invite an outsider, what do they expect? All right, Todd's been patient. Yes? Well, but it's, and this teacher explains to us, and this teacher said, and she doesn't, while entertainment would have been a factor, if I haven't considered in this whole scene, if I haven't considered God too much, and a preacher comes by a couple times a year and starts talking to me about morality and things that are practical and things that are from the Bible, and I go, hmm, how am I living versus what this is? It doesn't have to be entertaining to be compelling. Right. And in that circumstance, you could have large-scale conversions in rural communities because these preachers come a couple times a year, forcing you or at least allowing you to examine the mirror of your life versus the path mm -hmm. of the scripture. Right. And that's the thing. Uh, and, and that's one thing to think about as you're doing your homework. If we use the hook of entertainment to get somebody here, now the, the hope is – is that that hook is so embedded that that's not the hook they need to stay. Does that make sense? However, if all we offer is the hook of entertainment to get somebody here, more than likely what are we going to have to keep doing to keep them here? Entertain them. We're going to have to entertain them. Yes? Yeah, yeah. If if we announced our 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 next guest speaker for whatever event we're gonna have is gonna be Jesus, are you coming? Now and now and, I, and I'm saying like you you don't already belong here. You drive by and you see on the sign uh, a speaker this week, Jesus. Are you, are you like, okay, I got to check that out, right? Because what? We would like to hear Jesus speak. Now, what happens, as Todd said, when we go to the next level and um, it gets difficult? In John 6, we see the answer for some people. In John 6, we see the answer for some people. Okay, turn to John 6. <laughs> John 6 starts off uh, the first uh, uh, of so many verses. We're going to read towards the end. Uh, but the first 14 verses is about the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children. That's impressive. He fed people. He did a miracle. And people also got bread. Hey, a meal, you know, dinner and a show. All right. So they do that. Uh, uh, Jesus leaves that scene and he, he goes, uh, uh, sends his disciples head on the water. And then he walks on the water to them. So that gets their attention. Uh, would have been no doubt very entertaining and, and you know somewhere in the background Andrew's going stupid Peter um, anyways all that uh, uh, he, we get to he's teaching about the bread of heaven and, and he's doing all this teaching and that's the thing is he gets the other side the crowd that got the bread or heard about the bread they're waiting for him on the other side of the sea of Galilee and he starts getting up and he starts teaching morality and he starts teaching some deep theology I am the bread of life I'm what you need to consume not, not worried about physical bread, but worried about spiritual bread. I'm, I'm what you need. 
you need to follow me completely. Verse 60, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained uh, uh, about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before, if the Spirit who gives life to flesh profits nothing? The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who did not believe him and who would betray him. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So they had the hook. They had entertainment, bread, he does miracles. This guy's amazing. The teachings get difficult, and they go, we're done. That hook wasn't enough to keep them. All right? I, what does this all imply? I'll be honest. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know all the implications of this because we're, we're having a discussion class, and I'm going to open that back up in a minute. I promise. But, you know, you know what, 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 there's, there's definite implications here when we start thinking about so, how are we going to get people? All right? Andrew. Well, the way that Jesus was, you know, performing the miracles before he taught, it's not like the crowd. Imagine if he was just like, all right, I'm going to show all the miracles and all the crazy stuff and just start teaching. How many people would have followed him even today? That's a really good point. Without the miracles, less people would have heard. Less people would have come to hear him, and, and so, yeah, it, it's a, the miracles were a draw, and they were also done to prove he is Christ, Mark 16 and other passages, but, but at the end of the day, when the teaching got hard, some left. So there was a very patient hand back here. Do you still want to share your thought? Right. Keep, keep them engaged. That's and when they come up to you and they go, oh, I would have liked to hear that today. You know, what did you hear today? You know, what did I hear? Or I did, oh, my Lord entertained me. Then they probably listen to us because they enjoyed it. That's definitely what it is. Well, it, it was a good lesson. So. Right. And that's why I'm thinking. Think back to school when you were in school. What teachers and lessons do you remember the most? The ones with that dry teacher just droning on and on, uh, you know, uh, or do you remember the ones that engaged you? The ones that, like, uh, my, my school, my high school has an award-winning science teacher, and I, I did not like the subject of science. That might be as dangerous as saying I don't like cauliflower, uh, but I did not appreciate that, that field of study in school. But he always drew me in. It, it, like you couldn't help yourself the way he taught and the way he had enter entertainment value to it. It was like, I remember a lot of what he taught me because of that. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's exactly some of it. Why would the preacher take time to bring in history to it? And let me tell you, I have a good friend that he he was a former science teacher, so he brings science into the Bible in a way that that I'm like, whoa, I never I never put that together, you know. And that's that's yeah. Right, right. And, th and that's the thing. But the truth is, is as, as much as I appreciate, I think, the compliment, <laughs> as, as much as I appreciate that. Right. The truth is, is, is that going to bring in everybody? You know? Well, it might bring in somebody who doubts. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I will tell you and like cover Andrew's ears, but I, I do. I, I think that's interesting bringing somebody in who doubts um, because uh, when I turned into a teenager, 
um, uh, was right at the same time that we had the explosion in the Church of Christ of a, an emphasis of apologetics, uh, um, which, which I, I love that field of study. I love the, you know, asking wait, how do we know that and having answers. I love that field uh, uh, from apologetics to have the, the, the background and the logic behind what we believe. Uh, it's great. However, that, that built my faith how many people has that truly brought into to the church? Okay, there are books out there. Don't get me wrong. If you've read some of the bestsellers, there are books out there. But how many books are out there even? One, two, three. Because the truth is, is as I heard one atheist say in a debate, really all we're doing here is just bolstering the faith of those who already believe what they believe. Which has its place. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's bad, but when we start thinking about the greater mission of evangelism in the church, can even that do it? More than likely, my experience is somebody comes in from, from the community, and they already have a Christian, a believing background. And so we're really just... You know, even with, with the information we give them, yeah, we're building their faith and bolstering it, but they already kind of agree with us, you know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's keeping them hooked long enough, and this is, this is some of what we're, I, I'm trying to drive towards, keeping them hooked long enough to get to that deeper point. Because here's the truth. Let's go 50 years ago, when still we would have two-week gospel meetings. And, and we would see, um, um, uh, uh, let me go 60 years ago. Let me, I'm, I'm getting to the 60s, 1960s, which sadly, yes, is 60 years ago. I apologize for that fact. Um, so, so we go to the 1960s. Uh, 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 yes, there's, there's technology now a little bit. There's, uh, that's starting to show up. But still, the, the gospel meeting, the church events were still big community-wide events that brought people in. Um, but how many times? How many times was there actually pre-work done? You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, when uh, I've taken trips to Costa Rica and Katie's taken trips to Costa Rica, we ask the congregation we're going down to work with, there, please go out before we get there and knock doors and say, hey, we got these evangelists from the United States coming. We got these events. We don't say from America because they're from America too, and they will remind you of that over and over. We say we got evangelists from the United States coming down. Uh, uh, you know, would you like to meet with? Will you come one night to meet? They do pre-work. You go back to the '60s, and uh, if you're outside of the church, there's a chance that someone wanders by your house with a projection screen and a projector. <laughs> and film strips, and they say, can I come into your house and show you this? And they show it to you, and they say, oh, by the way, next March, we're having a, a gospel meeting where you can hear more about this pre-work is being done. See, what we would like, if, if, if and, and maybe, okay, maybe this is just me, what I would like is to meet some person out in the community, start a conversation that ends with these words, Hey, will you come to, to where I go to church sometime? Will you come visit? And the very next time we meet, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday night, uh, whatever it is, they're there. And again, they hear a couple of lessons. They come down front. They're in the water. Boom. But in 2022, without any pre-work being done, how likely is that to happen? I'm not saying impossible. Don't let me discourage you from just inviting somebody to come to church. But remember, again, something we went over last week. Who is the worship service for? Is it for evangelism? Now, it can't have an evangelizing level, but is it for evangelism? Who is worship service for? Christians to worship God. Yeah, I heard, I heard the whispers again. So, you know... I think what we forget is, A, we look in the past and we go, oh, they had such success. Well, society was different, so there was different reasons and ways they could have success. And then we also forget that what, what we think we see in evangelism in the 1960s in the United States of America amongst the Churches of Christ, we think we just see a duck from the top. 
You know that illustration? If you see a duck from the top, you think he's going all smooth, he's just gliding along. What's going on underneath the water? <laughs> he's paddling like crazy. I think a lot of times if we delve deeper into the success the church had in the 50s and the 60s, it's a duck. It looks like it's going smoothly up here, but underneath, <laughs> they're doing the pre-work. They're, they're really paddling, all right? You know, the average person just sees your neighbor come with you to church, and they see that, that that person's really listening and engaging and being taught the truth. But in all reality, you've been laying groundwork for months. You've asked that person to come with you so many times that you're embarrassed. Ever had that happen? I, I actually, I, I told, I, I've had that happen. I've, I've had people I've invited to come to church so many times that, that I finally just go, okay, I'm sorry, but I'm going to invite you again, <laughs> you know. Or the pre-work of, of, of already having a Bible study. Or the pre-work of showing a film strip. We have DVDs now. Uh, doing the, the pre-work. Of, and, and, oh, and yes, you can even stream it online. Um, you know, but, but the pre-work is being done. I can't really speak for the 1860s. Society was so different uh, uh, 150 years ago that I can't really speak how much pre-work was being done from house to house. But I think in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of pre-work being done that 60 years later, we ignore. And we say, oh, it was just easier back then. Was it? I don't I, <clears throat> I wasn't alive. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but I, I do know from some record keeping that I found is that they were doing a lot of pre-work. So where did we start? Um, <laughs> Well, I, th I, think, I think we started with some question to the extent of how are we going to fulfill the mission of the church? Is that kind of where we started? Or is it just, just where we're going to end? How are we going to fulfill the mission of the church? Yes. Yeah. Come and see the workings of God. Come and see uh, it's all invitations. Mm-hmm. And so we first need to open up the mouth and invite. Yeah. Inviting is a big part of it, you know, because like uh, beginning of John is just really I mean, yes, all through the New Testament and Christian ministry, but come and see, you know, uh, uh, Peter and Andrew, uh, uh, Andrew bringing Peter in. Uh, uh, bringing Nathaniel in, the, the guy who was like, I ah, anything good for, come from Galilee. You know, it's all about just come and see, just come and see. Um, you know, and, and, and that's, that's where a lot of it starts is opening our mouths and just trying to make that invitation. Now, there, there does sometimes need to be steps before that. You, you know, because that's the thing is, yeah, we can – to the people we already have a relationship with, so friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, you know, yeah, I go to the Pine Grove Church of Christ. Have you ever been to a church of Christ? Would you like to come? You know, yeah. But what about the stranger? As much of a close-knit community as, uh, uh, you know, Putnam County is, do you know everybody? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> you know. So, so what, what, you know, what are you going to do with the stranger? You, it may take that next step of saying, are your needs met? You okay? You know, getting to know them. But, you know, the truth is, oh, I thought the bell was going to ring. Oh, there it is. <laughs> he did too. Uh, the truth is, is that, again, sometimes it takes that pre-work of building a relationship. Uh, there again, 90s and, and early 2000s. Uh, uh, was a lot of uh, talking about relationship evangelism, friendship evangelism, you know, become friends with the person you're trying to convert. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is we started seeing the downturn of just relying on the gospel meeting and the events to bring people in. Okay, it's a hook to bring them into VBS, into the gospel meeting, into the seminar. That's a hook, but that wasn't keeping them because it, do you know what the number one factor and now may have changed over the last two years. But before the last two years, you know what the number one factor was on why somebody goes to a church and stays there? And this is any church. This is any name on the sign. Relationship. 
relationships. Relationships. Do I know somebody? Do I think they care about me? Do I care about them? Do I have somebody to sit with? Uh, do I have friends there? Relationships became really big. And so, you know, evangelism was taught in a way of build a relationship with somebody while trying to teach them, while trying to, to, to show them the gospel. So that became a strategy over the last 20, 25, <clears throat> 30 years. Um, uh, again, the last two years, they are uh, going to be an outlier in statistics, but they can still teach us something. That's why we want to take the time and talk about these things is because they can still teach us about what we're going to be uh, on the other side of, of whatever this is. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like, like what Henry said, where people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, we can throw in that uh, sometimes come and see means going and seeking. You know, it, it, to, to tell them come and see, we have to go and seek them, which means we have to go find them where they are. Uh, what did, uh, I, I'm thinking Luke 19 a lot for some reason. What did, what did Jesus do? He came to the city of Jericho, and he found a... Uh, uh, you know, well, I, we can't help it. We all think that little guy up in that sycamore tree and said, hey, I need to talk to you. So he sought Zacchaeus and then said, now come see what I'm about. So, yeah. So that's all part of it. Uh, any other questions, thoughts, ideas as we wrap up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And that. And there. There again. There. There's all this balance to everything we're talking about. I. I think when we get down to it, when we start trying to get hit, make the the, the rubber hit, hit hit the road, we're gonna be talking a lot about. So yeah, we need to tell them there's danger, but we need to tell them there's love. We need to tell. We, we need to be inviting people here, but we need to be going out there. We need to, you know, there's going to be this this back and forth that that we have as part of this to 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 do both things. We want to be welcoming, and inviting in in this room, while at the same time going out and seeking, um, and, and and then at the same time, and sometimes we're going to have to dig a little deeper, like Jesus does in John six, and get deep with people. You know, sometimes it's just, hey, come here this nice little lesson on the Bible. And then sometimes it's going to be, hey, we need to challenge you. So, yeah, all good thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, but I can tell by the phone ringing that we're about done. Uh, so, uh, again, the question we were trying to answer today is uh, how are we going to take part in the mission of Christ? And your homework for two weeks from today is what what gets you coming to worship or what, what the one thing that, that helps you come to worship and what would bring somebody else into coming into worship? There's your homework, and I'll quit talking now. Thank you very much.
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess we'll leave it on top there. Nobody's going Good morning. It is good to see everybody here in person this morning and also good to have those joining us online. And uh, again, as always, uh, if there's anything we can do for anybody, please let us know. Uh, those who are joining us online, let us know how you're doing. Uh, and we'd love to hear an update from those who we know are, are traveling or sick. And we're praying for you and your safety and health. Uh, Please get a hold of a bulletin one way or another. Uh, there are bulletins in back if you're here in person. I did email out the bulletin uh, uh, later this morning because it slipped my mind, but we did get it out there. So if you're on the email list, there should be a bulletin in your inbox, and you can check all the announcements there as we get ready for our singing emphasis tonight at 5 p.m., and if you want to request a song, you could put one on the table. Uh, I guess we could say this, too. If, you're, uh, if you are watching online and would like to request a song for tonight, uh, again, text it, message it to us, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do about getting that led tonight. After tonight, we will have a, a time of fellowship where uh, uh, food will be served, so uh, please plan on participating in that. Uh, if you're interested in teaching Bible classes, there's a sign-up sheet in back. Uh, there's several events that are, are, are starting to be advertised for the spring, and amongst those, we want to advertise our own event, uh, the Spring Seminar with uh, Doug Burleson from Fried Harmon University on You Can Trust Your Bible. Uh, that is what his expertise is in, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to hosting Doug and his family uh, in March for that. Uh, there's also going to be a, a youth rally uh, in the Parkersburg area in uh either late March or early April, I have the flyer. So I'll put it up and you can look in when that's going to be happening uh, and tell anybody you might know who is interested in that to participate in that. Um, we have updates and information about those who we've been praying for, who are sick or have surgeries coming up, but we will share those at the end of services. Uh, so again, you know, see bulletin, check out the, the, the information in there. And if you need anything else, please let us know. It's good to be together this morning. It's good to have this opportunity to worship. And so let's pray as we get ready to worship together. Our Father in heaven, we, we pray at this time that we can clear our minds of our, our cares from the world and our anxieties and that we can just focus on you as we worship you this morning. We pray what we do will be pleasing to you and that we'll do it in spirit and truth with our focus on you. We just pray you guide us through this time of worship as we pray you guide us in all that we do in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we say this prayer. Amen. This morning, our first selection is number 111. 111. Um, we that love the Lord and let our choice be known, join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, it 
beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, the children of a heavenly King, the children of a heavenly King, may speak fair joys abroad, may speak fair joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion hills a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, or walk the golden streets, or walk the golden streets, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Our next selection is number 427. Number 427. After the singing of this hymn, we'll have our scripture reading and a word of prayer. <clears throat> Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. The consecrated cross I'll bear till he shall set me free, and then go home my cross to wear, for there's a crown for me. O precious cross, O glorious crown, O resurrection day. Ye angels from the stars come down and bear my soul away. I'm going to read to you this morning the words of Jesus. There is no greater support for 
the inspiration of the scriptures and their worth to us than the fact that Jesus took them to heart. He read them and he respected them as the holy word of God. And if they're good enough for Jesus, then they're good enough for us. That's uh, uh, in, in Luke, the fourth chapter, I'm going to be reading from verses 14 through 21. We see Jesus has just been, uh, had received the baptism of John, gone into the, the wilderness and been tempted for 40 days. And he just comes out and begins his ministry and in verse 41, uh, verse 14, excuse me. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee and there went out into a, out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in the synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came into Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those which are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. With the words of Jesus upon our hearts, let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come unto you now offering our, our, our humble prayer and, and looking upon uh, our lives here and and. And, and praying for your, your presence and for your, your wisdom, for your glory, that the, all things here, that are done here this day might be to the glory of your holy name and to the edifying of your people. We pray, dear Father, that you would bless us and as we partake of, of the spiritual food here, that, that, that we read the, the words of Jesus and, and the prophecies which were made of him and his fulfillment of them. And, and we're so grateful, Father, for you're having given us these words that we might be able to, to be uh, assured of, of, our, of our salvation because of his great victory over death. We're so grateful, Father, for, for his life, for his, his love, for his teaching, and for his obedience unto you. And we're so grateful for your mercy and grace which allows all this to happen. We're wonderfully amazed at the beauty of your creation and its power and strength, and we thank you for all that you do that sustains our lives here. We know, dear Father, that we are weak and sinful creatures, that we fail you in many ways every day, that we have wasted so much of the precious time you've given us, and that we have uh, sinned and done those things which we ought not to do in, in this body. We pray, dear Father, that you will forgive us and help us to go stronger each day to resist temptation, flee from evil, and help us to repent of all that would keep us from you. Help us now as we, as we think upon these words and as we, we hear the lesson that's taught this day that we might rededicate ourselves each and every moment that we might be uh, your people and we might be uh, the, the message that's spoken unto this community and that the many souls might be saved. We pray that you would help uh, your, your will be done throughout all this world and, and in the end when, when our time is done here, we, we pray, dear Father, that we'll be able to come unto you and and be welcomed into that home of the souls. Have mercy on us, we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Upon each first day of the week when we come together, we partake of the Lord's Supper. But before doing so, if you would please turn with me to number 330. Number 330. On this Lord's day we assemble round the table of the Lord. Happy hearts are made to tremble when we hear his blessed word. Thanks to God for such a Savior now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for his exalted favor, bless memorial of his love. We recall his broken body 
as we look upon his bread. Give ye thanks divide and eat it in my memory, he said. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for his exalted favor, bless me for all of his love. And this crimson cup reminds us of that dread scene long ago, when he died in pain and anguish, there his blood was made to flow. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for his exalted favor. Bless me, moral of his love. There in agony he suffered on the cross for you and me. Now upon the truth he's reigning, blessed Lamb of Calvary. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for his exalted favor, Bless me, moral of his love. I liked into that song, that last last part of it. Bless me, moral of his love. You know, it's been six weeks since me and Bard been able to you know, come to church here and be with our brothers and sisters here at Pine Grove. And, you know, we relied on Jesus a lot. You know, uh, my mom passing, and um, we all were sick. But, you know, in those times, you tend to rely on Jesus a lot, you know, and, and you pray and you pray and you pray. And, and, and when Jesus died on the cross, for us, he died for the love of us, you know, that we have that opportunity to spend eternity with him in heaven. And as Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 says, As now there was any bread, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you, Father, thanking you, thanking you for the love that you have for us, Father. And, and as this memorial to you, we pray that you bless this bread as we partake of it and remember that, that you give that the forgiveness of sin that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again. We pray that you bless us through the vine which represented the blood that Jesus shed for our sins on the cross, Father. May we put all worldly thoughts out of our head, Father, and focus on that cross for the love that Jesus had for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord Lord's Supper, and uh, we have time to uh, give a remains as a church established in the first century on how we should do this and and to me the money is just to save souls that's what you know 
God wants us to do in our lives and the money that we take down here at Pine Grove, that's what we need to do is save souls and, and fulfill needs. Let's pray to God. Dear Henry, God, we come to you, Father. We pray that, that you bless those people that are making decisions on, on the finances here at Pine Grove, Father. May you bless them. May you give them the wisdom and the knowledge, Father, to use your money wisely. To And we pray that some way, somehow, somebody will be touched, Father, and, and realize that Jesus is the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song of Encouragement to Come to Christ after Brother Jack's lesson this morning. It's number 103. Number 103. If you would, please mark that at this time. After having marked that, if you would, please turn to number 72. Number 72. If you would, if you'd like, please stand. Beyond the sunset, O oh blissful morning, when with our Savior have misbegun, there's told the end of all glorious dawning. Beyond the sunset, when day is done, beyond the sunset, no clouds will gather, no storms will threaten, no fears annoy. O oh, day of gladness, O oh, day unending, be the sunset eternal joy beyond the sunset a hand will guide me to God the Father whom I adore his glorious presence his word of welcome will be my portion on that fair shore. Beyond the sunset, oh glad reunion with our dear loved ones who've gone before. In that fair homeland, we'll know no parting beyond the sunset forevermore. Well, again, good morning. Again, thank you to the men who lead us in worship and direct our thoughts so well. We are trying to reflect on Christ when we come together at these times. We're trying to focus on Him and encourage one another to do so. And, and uh, we started last week's lesson like we'll start this week's lesson with the reminder that Christ says, pick up your cross and follow me. We have it recorded more than once in Scripture, but uh, Luke 9, 23 is where, where we uh, are, are focusing on because we're actually studying out of Luke 18. And while this week's lesson is a continuation of last week's lesson, you didn't need to hear last week's lesson to follow along with what we're going to talk about this week. Last week, we did focus on, on the context of, of Luke 18, 31 through 34, that we'll be studying here in a moment. We focused on where Jesus was teaching from, but more when, because he's approaching the time where he's going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. He's approaching the end of his life. He is less than a month from that moment. 
We focused on, on, on how he was soon going to cross over the Jordan River into the town of Jericho, where he would meet that man named Zacchaeus in Luke 19. And, and he would wander, not wander, but go into the city riding on the colt of a donkey. And we focused that in the meantime, the master teacher, as we read his words earlier, was teaching. The master teacher who believed in the inspired scriptures of the Old Testament was using Old Testament lessons to make the new applications to prepare people for the kingdom that Christ was coming to establish, that he was coming to build. And so he was pointing people to that, pointing the disenfranchised to that, as he taught about a, a, a widow who was persistently seeking and a, a tax collector who prayed more righteously than the Pharisee. He welcomed little children to him and he taught a rich man the important lesson of not letting the physical means of this world get in his way of serving God and then taught everybody that no matter how rich we are with God, all things are possible that God can save us. And so he teaches all of this and then has his disciples to the side and says, I'm going to go die. In Luke chapter 18, verse 31, it says, Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked, insulted, and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him again, and the third day he will rise again. Again. While this is the third time he has made this prediction in front of these men, it would have still been a disturbing message. So disturbing that maybe they just wanted to deny it. Maybe they wanted to say, that can't mean what he says it means. Over these last two years, have we heard bad news? Have we heard bad news that we want to say, no, that can't be true? What do you do when you hear that a famous person has passed away? I never believe it until I check online and find reputable news sources, whether those exist or not, that say that, yes, that's what happened. We find in verse 34, it says, But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. And so it is by chance you know, they were hidden from them that they couldn't understand them because God was somehow keeping them from understanding them. But at the same time, it says before that, they didn't understand it. They didn't understand these things. For one reason or another, they did not accept this message and did not understand that Jesus was going to have to die so that he could resurrect. Do you, you, know, you know that? That's a prerequisite. If you're going to resurrect from the dead, you have to die. I mean, we even read of a few cases in the Bible where someone did not die. Enoch and Elijah were called up into the heavens. And so in some kind of weird way, they may never resurrect. The rest of us are looking to a time like Christ was looking to when we will pass from this life, but we look forward to our resurrection. We understand this now because we have the completed gospel. We understand this now because we have the full picture. It is not kept from us what Jesus is saying here. It might have been kept from them, but we can know what he's saying here. And we need to again realize why is he saying this? Why is this being spoken here? Why is Jesus trying to tell them, I'm going to die, but I'm going to resurrect? And the first and foremost reason we must realize why he's doing this is because, because he's trying to show them who he is. He's trying to prove that he is 
their word, Messiah, our word, Christ. He is trying to prove it to them that he's the one that's been promised and he's fulfilling the promises and he's doing so by performing a miracle here. Now wait, verses 31 through 34 of Luke chapter 18, did he perform a miracle? Tell me what the weather's going to be tomorrow with 100% certainty and be right. Tell me the temperatures and the things and everything. You may get lucky and guess. You may open your, your weather app and say, well, well, my weather app says it's going to be. No, you tell me right now without looking. It's hard to predict the future. It's hard to know what's going to happen. We can guess, we can assume, but can we know with certainty? To know with certainty is to perform a prophecy, and Christ was performing a prophecy that within a couple of weeks, he was going to die, and three days later, he was going to resurrect. He includes some of the details of when he's going to die, that he's going to be scourged and spat upon and mocked, and these things are going to happen to him. He's not just going to die. He's going to die a shameful, incredibly painful death, and he is proving this we must remember that that a lot of christ's mission was proving who he is and proving that he did come from god luke tells us at the beginning of his gospel in chapter one verse one inasmuch as as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of these things which have been fulfilled among us just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to them to us it seemed good to me also having had had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Luke here tells us, I'm writing this gospel to tell you what you can know with certainty, what you can know for sure. And what is that? What does Luke want to prove to his, his reader Theophilus and to his readers 2,000 years later? He wants to prove that Jesus is the Christ. And so when we are reading through the gospel of Luke and Matthew and Mark and John, we have to keep in mind that the gospel writer's point is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. And they do it by showing him fulfilling prophecies, making prophecies, and fulfilling the prophecies he made. I mean, sure, we can go back to, to uh, uh, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why are you forsaken? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? These words are the words that, that Jesus will use on the cross. He's borrowing words from David to say, I'm fulfilling what David was really talking about, and that is the suffering of the Messiah. We can turn to passages like Isaiah 53 and time will not allow us to read the whole thing, but look down in verse 7 where it says, He was opposed and he was afflicted. Excuse me, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the, for, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. See, Isaiah, 600 years before Jesus is born, is able to tell us details about his death. So yes, Christ is fulfilling those prophecies from David a thousand years before, from Isaiah 600 years before. He is going to, to die with the wicked but be buried with the rich. We know how, how that happens and we can prove these things. But that's not all. He's not just fulfilling the prophecies made by others. He's fulfilling the, fulfilling the prophecies made by himself. And that's the miracle of Luke 18, 31 through 33. He says three days later he will rise again. And when you turn over to Luke chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, 
They and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord. And it happened as, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of the sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Jesus makes the prophecy for the third time about his death, burial, and resurrection. And then in Luke 24, verses 1 through 7, we read it. Hallelujah. That means praise Jehovah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah that these things happened, proving who Christ is, proving he's the Messiah, and proving he accomplished what he came to do. Oh, I bet you remember it. I remember it. I remember uh, a, a certain president standing on a certain ship and emblazoned above him on a big banner said, mission accomplished. And there was a lot of confusion surrounding that. And been explanations since then, helping us understand better the context of what was said. We don't need anything like that here to understand that Christ accomplished his mission. When he died on the cross, but overcame death by resurrecting three days later. There's no confusion about what he was doing and what he came to do because as much as we, we, we do read these things to prove who Christ is, the reason we got to prove who Christ is is because of what he came to do. As he told Zacchaeus, I came to seek and save the lost. And as we see later in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did Christ have to die? Because to atone from sins, something has to die. Hebrews, well, practically the entire beginning of the book, but primarily chapters 8 and 9, that's what they're all about. Sacrifices had to be made. Bulls and goats had to be slaughtered. Blood had to be shed to atone for the sins of the people. In Leviticus, it's instructed exactly how that was going to work, that if you commit a trespass or a sin, here's what you offer and how you offer it so the blood is shed and people can be atoned for. And Hebrews says, how did that work for you? How did that work having to go to Jerusalem or to the tabernacle and offering those sacrifices year after year, time after time, because of your sins and your mistakes. Was that a good system for everybody? It wasn't. Because in 2022, I live in uh, uh, Scott Depot, West Virginia, and I haven't done the math, but, but Jerusalem's pretty far away. It would be a, a pretty a pretty hard place for me to get to on a yearly basis. I'd, I'd like to see it once, but I can't go every year. I certainly can't go every time I mess up. That system worked for a while. It was good for a while, but it wasn't good for all time. And so Jesus died and resurrected so that our sins can be overcome of once and for all, so that the mission is accomplished, so that he can prove he's Christ, and proving he is Christ proves he can save us from our sins. Now, the assignment I've been given with this lesson is to answer the question, how do we lead like the Lord by facing his challenges. His challenge is the cross. He took up his cross and he bore it for us. 
How can we learn from that example? How can we learn from the master teacher doing these things as he's teaching us his word? And we need to remember that his goal as the master teacher was to show us all things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, just the deep things of God. And then Jesus says in John 16, uh, chapter, chapter 16, verse 13, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. So Jesus says, look, we're going to make sure you have the whole story. We're going to make sure you know all things you need to know about Christ and how to have his salvation. And, and, and that's where it starts. If we're going to lead, we must be willing to learn. We must be willing to say, so, so where are we leading people? Where are we trying to take them to? Where are we trying to get them? So we have to learn so that we can lead others. And that's the thing. Once we learn, we got to teach. You know, I remember uh, 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 one of the first times I really had to take leadership was, was in Boy Scouts. And, and we were, we were, I was in charge of a project to plant a row of, of trees. And I get there, and I have all the tools set up, and I start digging, and I look up, and everybody else is just standing around. And I thought, what are they doing? One of the adults there said, you got to lead them. It's not enough just for you to get your hands dirty. You got to tell them what to do. So I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to dig holes. We're going to put trees in. You think not that hard, right? But unless you tell somebody, they don't know. Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So that's easy to remember. 2, 2, 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, And these things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul tells Timothy, you learn so you can teach. You commit them to yourself so you can commit them to others. What you've learned, you share with others. Christ wants us to teach the world the gospel, period. It's a command. He tells us to do it, but he doesn't leave us grasping in the wind. After he tells us to teach, he says, and lo, I'm with you always. He says, he's saying, I'm giving you everything you need to teach them. I'm giving you the ability. I'm giving you the lessons. I'm giving you what you need to teach them. And the truth is, is when we teach them, we must teach them completely. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28, Christ says, for I have, excuse me, let me get to the right page. Luke 14, 28, Christ says, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? I mean, the truth is, Christ is facing the challenge of the cross and then telling us to tell other people about it. And we need to be honest with them. Following Christ means picking up our crosses and following Christ. It's not always going to be easy. And so we teach them everything. We teach them that there's a, a cost to count. Because life's going to be hard, <laughs> by the way, whether you're a Christian or not. Life's going to be hard. There's going to be difficulties. The question is, is how are you going to get through it? With the help of Christ and his plan of salvation or by yourself? See, that's the information Christ gives us to give to others. Hey, yeah, life's hard. But with Christ, we have a hope that's out of this world, that's beyond this life. And so we take that example of Christ saying, I'm going to go die to be honest with the world around us. You're going to die too. But when the resurrection comes, are you going to be with Christ or are you going to be without him? And so as always, there does come a point in time where we must exemplify to the world around us. To show the world Christ, we must face his challenges. Or, as we simply say, we must practice what he, he preaches. You know, I think we need to remember that, that the cross of Christ loomed in his entire life. He knew it was coming. He, he dreaded it coming. 
It didn't surprise him when he started predicting it was coming about three years before it came. He knew it was going to be there. Back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, the devil took him on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. The temptation here is to tell Christ, you don't have to face the cross. Hey, Christ, you came to conquer the world, says Satan. And while he doesn't completely understand that mission, he's trying to still offer a way out of that. A get out of the cross free card. And he's trying to say, hey, if you will just give it up to me. I'll make you ruler of the world. That's what you came to do, right? Let's get out of this cross. Let's get out of that difficulty. Let's not bruise your heel. But Jesus tells him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord, the Lord your God, and him only you shall worship. See, Christ knew he was going to have to suffer. And so what did he tell his followers, those who would follow him? He says, you're going to have to suffer. In fact, you turn a page over to Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. But are you, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Count it great when you suffer for the cause of Christ, because Christ suffered for the cause of Christ. Count it a blessing when you are facing persecution, because the followers of Christ face persecution. It's a marker of what we are. But also count it a blessing because we're not looking for earthly comforts. We're not looking for the easy way out to make life easier here. We're looking for heavenly rewards. See, when we're facing Christ's challenges, we need to do so so we can lead others to him. So people can look at what we face when we face the hardships of the world and say, they're facing it differently than we do. They're facing it in, in a different way. They have a different way to handle this, and ideally it's a more successful way because we're looking beyond the here and now. We're looking beyond the suffering of the moment, and we're looking to follow Christ. See, leaders lead by example, and one of the best examples leaders leave with us is how they face suffering, how they face the hardships. Christ says, I'm going to go die in a couple of weeks, but I'm going to do it, fulfilling all the prophecies, even his own, and then says, now pick up your cross and follow me. And that glorious moment where we say, hallelujah, he raised from the dead, we will get to echo in our own resurrection, hallelujah, we will raise from the dead. And ideally, we'll be able to say, and hallelujah, you will raise from the dead, and you will raise from the dead, and you will raise from the dead to go to heaven for all eternity and live with all the hope therein. That's how we face our challenges like Christ, is by looking to heaven and following his path there. He went to prepare it, John 14. We must follow it. Christ centered his life on his cross. He knew it was coming. He was preparing for it. We need to center our lives on his cross. We know, we know it's central to all we do. The entirety of history revolves around the cross. Whether it's recognized by the individual or not, everything will come down to that fact of whether you accept Jesus' cross or not. Do you recognize it? For what it is, because Jesus simply says, pick up your cross and follow me. That means following his leadership, going where he went, facing what he faced in the ways he did so. And it includes leading others to him. 
because Jesus was trying to constantly pull people to the cross. The widow, the tax collector, and the Pharisee. The little children and the rich man. The tax collector named Zacchaeus. And everybody else, even his closest followers, he was trying to pull to the cross. Have you been pulled to the cross? When you look to the cross for your salvation, based on what it is and what it does for you, you will, you will turn over your life. You will give up your life of, of physical desires and needs and repent uh, of, of that life of sin and then look to Christ. Being willing to tell people that. That's what confession is. Being willing to say, yes, I'm looking towards the cross of Jesus and serving and following him. That's what my life is about now, even though it may not have been in the past. And then based on that confession, you're baptized for the remission of sins. Because as Jesus died and was buried, he rose from the grave. And we go down to the waters of baptism to die and bury our old person and rise from the watery grave to live for Christ like Christ continues living for us. And so we pick up our cross to follow him by obeying him and then by leading others to him and by showing the world around us his cross. And so as always, if we can help you do this, if we can assist you in picking up your cross and following him, we want to know how we can help you. Let us know. And as always, if there's anybody in this room, now is the opportunity to say, I want to follow Christ. I want to pick up my cross and follow his cross. And so if we can help anybody do that today who's in this room, please come forward while we stand and sing the invitation song. Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to day, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come to day, come to Jesus, do not tarry. Enter in at mercy's gate. Oh, delay not till the morrow, lest thy coffee be too late. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to day. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, dying sinner, other Savior there is not. He will share with you his glory. When your pilgrim age is done, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Jack, we'd like to thank you for such a wonderful class this morning, as well as a wonderful and challenging sermon. Uh, at this time, we will uh, go ahead and be dismissed. Afterwards, we will have our uh, private uh, announcements. At this time, let us pray. Our loving Father who art in heaven, it's again, we're so thankful and so blessed to have been here this morning. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this congregation here at Pine Grove, and we pray your richest blessings upon us as we strive to do your will, carry out your will. And, Father, we bring this 
this our, our worship here this morning to you. Father, we pray that it's been acceptable in your sight. We ask your blessings upon us as we leave this place. Keep us safe, we pray. Father, bless us in life and be with us in death. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.